The Atari 7800. Such a pity. This poor little guy could have been great had been given half a chance. But we're not here to mourn what could have been, but rather pay a modest tribute to the pro system, which also happens to serve up one of my favorite games, Food Fight. That's happening now on this week's catchphrase spewing episode of Full House. By 1984, Atari was a limping asset under Warner Communications. Besides the weak performance of the 5200 console and failed negotiations with Japan's Nintendo to distribute their family computer stateside, there was also that recent nasty industry-wide crash. The aftermath was not pretty. Stock prices plummeted, executives were sent packing, and it seems like the idea of a home game console was a passing fad. Keep in mind, people were still playing video games. Many were just doing it on home computers, with this capability for more complex types of games. Those who weren't were making do with old hardware, like the Atari 2600, especially now since older games were hitting clearance bins by the ton. When Atari announced the 7800 Pro system that May, it was seen they were quite interested in bringing together both types of customers with a single unit. On paper, the Atari 7800 seemed like a winner, especially since Atari had learned from its mistakes. The 5200's terrible analog controllers and lack of backwards compatibility with 2600 titles was the source of much derision from consumers and critics. The 7800 was designed to play virtually all 2600 titles without any additional hardware, and the digital self-centering joysticks, while still not perfect, were a vast improvement. The 7800 had an expansion port to accept a keyboard, disk drives, and printer if you wanted to turn the console into a home computer somewhere down the line. And for the hyper-competitive, a high-score cartridge was conceived so that the players can keep track of their numerical accomplishments. The most attractive feature of this package, however, was the price tag. $140. Inexpensive for a new console at the time, and unbelievable considering the graphical capabilities of the 7800. Ports of arcade games that were often visually lacking back in the day were finally closer to authentic than ever before, even including those off-jettisoned bells and whistles like intermissions. There was some trade-off to achieve this price point. The 7800 used the same outdated sound hardware as the 2600 to maintain compatibility. However, the system was able to address custom sound chips on individual cartridges to overcome this limitation. Hoping to reclaim the video game throne and quite possibly reinvigorate the home console market, Atari launched the 7800 in a few test cities in June of 1984. Behind the scenes, Warner Communications was making other plans. In July, the home consumer division of Atari would be sold to Commodore founder Jack Trammell. Further distribution and production was put on hold during his changeover, while deals were evaluated and renegotiated. In January of 1986, the Atari 7800 finally saw the light of day. However, the enthusiasm for the system was not as strong. The marketing budget for the system was next to nothing, and only four games were initially available alongside the new console. Miss Pac-Man, Joust, Asteroids, and the Pac-In pulled position two, despite over a dozen being promised prior to the original launch. While these were quite possibly the best versions of these games available up until this point, these were still old titles. Some already released several times over on various prior platforms. The expansion port was removed on later runs of the console, and the planned high score cartridge was quietly cancelled. Meanwhile, Nintendo had just started making waves with their newly dubbed entertainment system. Though they weren't the juggernaut quite yet, it was hard for discerning consumers and industry gawkers to ignore its momentum. As Atari trickled out conversions of computer games like Choplifter, Karateka, and Impossible Mission, alongside classic arcade ports of Robotron 2084, Centipede, and Dig Dug, Nintendo would be breaking new ground with monumental titles like Super Mario Bros. and The Legend of Zelda. Further hampering Atari was the lack of solid third-party publishers. While they did have Absolute Entertainment, Frago, and Activision, their contributions were but a blip. Seems when Nintendo rode into town, they brought along with them many strict rules for third-party publishers, including being forbidden from making games for competitors. Since Nintendo quickly became the dominant home console, third parties had no choice but to adhere to these rather strict rules. But wait a minute. If that's true, how did the Atari 7800 get a version of Double Dragon, or Commando, or even Nintendo's own Donkey Kong, Donkey Kong Jr., and Mario Brothers? Simple. The exclusivity limitation applied only to publishers. 
The arcade copyright holder was still free to license the game to different publishers for other consoles. The 7800 limped along until the end of 1991, at which time Atari pulled the plug on the 7800 along with the venerable 2600 console. Only 60 titles were ever released for the system, not including homebrews, but it still remained profitable for Atari owing to their minimal investment in the product. I'm not gonna lie to you, I think the 7800 is a sexy little piece of machinery, even today. Simple lines, black finish with a large silver accent playing host to a dash of gradient colors, and the raised letters really adds a touch of class. The cartridges, those nice, easy to store, visually appealing rectangles, are unchanged from the 2600 days. I did always hate that these Atari consoles had no cover for the cartridge slot, especially as dust breeds in my room faster than bacteria on a gas station restroom toilet. The familiar difficulty switches are tucked away under the front lip. On the top you have the essential power button, a dedicated pause button, and a select and a reset button which parrot their respective VCS switches. The pause button does replicate the old color black and white switch, but since it's not a toggle but rather returning to an original position after pressed, the game will not stay in black and white. Not that it matters, but there are some 2600 games that use this switch for other functions or options. And no, you can't pause the old games. Only those 7800 games that have this functionality programmed. The Proline joysticks look sleek and, as mentioned, are a marked improvement over the 5200 sloppy, non-centering analog controls. It's still painful to use for an extended period as the buttons have a fair amount of resistance to them and the controller itself is scrawny. Atari released gamepads in the European market to address some of these complaints. Luckily, the controller parts with a long-time standard 9-pin type, meaning old Atari joysticks and peripherals will work on this as well, so long as you're playing a game that doesn't require two separate action buttons. I must admit, I don't have a terribly large 7800 library. I blame the fact that I haven't run across a copy of Ninja Golf just yet. I do have Pole Position 2, One-on-One, uh, -on -one, Choplifter, Karateka, and Miss Pac-Man. But the game that keeps this console plugged in for me is this little gem right here. Food Fight! Food Fight was a 1983 arcade game developed by General Computer Corporation, henceforth GCE. Their claim to fame in the industry was an enhancement kit for the original Pac-Man game called Crazy Auto that evolved into Miss Pac-Man. As part of a lawsuit settlement with Atari over similar kits for Missile Command, GCE became one of their most versatile contributors. In addition to Food Fight, they developed the arcade game Quantum, produced numerous 2600 and 5200 cartridges, as well as being the instrumental in the creation of the 7800 itself along with its initial batch of games. Food Fight is simple but charmingly addictive. You play the role of Charlie Chuck, whose main goal is to eat the ice cream on the opposite side of the playfield. Standing between you and your tasty treats are four ornery chefs named Angelo, Zorba, Oscar, and Jacques. Using the piles of food as your ammunition, you must fight your way to the ice cream cone while avoiding any contact with these chefs or their edible projectiles. Falling into manholes or letting the ice cream melt will also end your turn early. The action gets faster and more intense as the levels progress, but the scoring potential increases as well. Play long enough and you'll have a score that will be sure to impress all of your ex-lovers. The home version impressively replicates the instant replay feature found in the arcade. If you cheat death or do something really awesome, the game will show you your performance with some whimsical music timed along to the final gulp of the ice cream cone. It seems silly, but triggering it will fill you with an overcoming sense of pride. There's not much to say about Food Fight. It's definitely not the deepest game in the world, but it's quite entertaining. But even if Food Fight isn't your thing, there is sure to be something on Atari's overlooked piece of hardware that will justify finding one. The great thing is that most of the titles are quite inexpensive. You definitely can't go wrong with the arcade ports, but do avoid their literally impossible version of Impossible Mission. This was Day for TV Games. As usual, please remember to like, comment, and subscribe, unless otherwise directed by your doctor. And of course, I'll see you next time. It's still hot in here. What do you want? I want a tar. I do. What do you want? I want a tar. What do you want? I want a tar. I do. What do you want? I want a tar. What do you want? I want a tar. I do. What do you want? I want a tar. What do you want? I want a tar. I do. What do you want? I want a tar. What do you want? I want a tar. I do. What do you want? But the game that keeps this console plugged in is this fun little gem right here. Ah. Food fight. Is that better? Yeah, that's fine.